set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Purify my heart. Thank you very much to the music group. Thank you for joining us and supplying such lovely music to worship God as we come into his presence this morning. So a big welcome to you all to Advent 2. And uh, we're going to start by lighting the Advent candle. Advent is a time of waiting, of preparing, longing for Jesus to return and when we light the second candle, it's like we're, we're pushing the darkness back further and further as we greet the light of the world, come to be our saviour. So last week, who can tell me what the candle was last week? What did it represent? Hope. Hope. And this time it's peace and Winnie is going to help me light the candle in fact she's going to do it now she's going to light the second candle thank you Winnie so that's the peace candle and then we'll remind ourselves about hope from last week very good excellent and now we're going to say a prayer together thank you Michael I'm going to say the first line, and Winnie actually is going to join me on the first line. Do you remember? We're going to say that together, the one in white, and then would everybody like to respond with the words in yellow? So, Prince of Peace, we seek you. In far-off lands, your children flee their homes, pursued by violence. In our community, we know not all our neighbours are safe from brutality. Prince of Peace, we seek you. You sent your son, Jesus. Yes, you sent your son, Jesus, to bring your peace and comfort to the world. In this season of Advent, renew and strengthen us in a commitment to your peace that surpasses all understanding. Ready, Winnie? Prince of Peace, we seek you. May your peace fill our hearts and grace our lips so that we might be agents of your peace in the world. Amen. At Toddlers this week, which I've been delighted to join over the last few weeks, um, uh, we made up an Advent song. And uh, I think that you could join us in singing it. When are you going to come here? I don't know if the microphone will pick us up here, if we do it like this. Okay, so we're going to sing the first line and you're going to respond, all right? <coughs> we are waiting. We are waiting. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. For the birth of Jesus. For, For the birth of Jesus. Jesus. On Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. Very good. We'll do it again. We are waiting. We are waiting. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. For the birth of Jesus. For the birth of Jesus. On Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. I think they're quite good. Do you think we can put them into two? Okay, here we go. We're going to put you into two. So, Will, you're over there. Winnie and me are over here. All right. So, we're going to start. And when we've done We Are Waiting twice, they're going to come in. Right, so we're going to sing twice and then we'll be <laughs> We are waiting, we are waiting. Yes, we are, yes, we are. For the birth of Jesus, for the birth of Jesus. On Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. We are waiting, we are waiting. Yes, we are, yes, we are. For the birth of Jesus, for the birth of Jesus, on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day.
Excellent. Now we're going to sing a, a slightly more grown-up version and my all-time favourite Advent song, When He Comes. Would you like to stand if you can and sing? <clears throat> So today we're moving on to the final talk in our series on the Christian way of life, which we've taken from a few chapters, 12 to 14, of Romans. Uh, can anyone remember what the previous themes were? Will started on Remembrance Sunday with... Oh, good. <laughs> that rememberable. <laughs> he spoke on worship and the common life. Then Margaret spoke about the law and talked about love. We all speak about love. Jonathan last week spoke about... Oh, you're going to have to go back and look at your notes, you know. He spoke on Christian duty. And uh, I'm going to talk about Christian liberty. Um, but before that, Jonathan posed some questions last week. Uh, which uh, Margaret sent out an email. And he has had some responses, and he would like to share 
something about those now. So Jonathan is going to just do that. Well, I think to say that response is plural was a slight exaggeration, Roz. Uh, I had one good response from, uh, from Bob, and I just wanted to share that with you. Remember, one of my suggestions was that there were things, in addition to being good citizens, which we all need to be as Christians, there were things that we might like to do which were a bit outside of our comfort zone, um, perhaps take part in a protest march or something of that sort. And uh, perhaps if we find that a bit daunting, um, then Bob's suggestion might come in because he suggested that we all ought to write to our member of parliament, Richard Graham, about things which disturb us because he's our representative in government. And I thought, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a good idea. And um, he had some suggestions about things that we could write about, and here they are. Um, he wondered whether we should write to him about the Windrush scandal and the whole business about creating a hostile environment for people who actually we should be welcoming uh, as, as, as people uh, who have come to join us. And then there's the Grenfell Tower scandal the fact that those poor people um, still haven't had justice as to what happened when that dreadful fire took place. Um, then integrity in government and society. We as Christian people should, should be concerned about truth and justice. Integrity is a very good word in our society. And the fact that uh, you know, we're worried about there's a certain amount of corruption and sleaze, apparently, in high places. And then fourthly and lastly, uh, attitudes to women. Um, uh, the, the fact that our society is still male-dominated, that it's misogynist, and that women often even aren't safe. Um, we could write about, about uh, all of these things. Now, I know Richard Graham, our, our member of Parliament. Um, he's not exactly a friend, uh, <laughs> but then he's not an enemy either. Uh, and to be honest, he's very good at replying to uh, people's correspondence. If you write to him, he will take the time to write back to you and explain what he thinks the government is doing. So this is not a lost cause, and I think Bob's idea is a very good idea. Thank you very much, Ross. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, there's food for thought uh, for you. I know Will spends quite a lot of time writing to Richard Graham. Right. I went on a, a music course recently, and um, we were asked to buy the music before we went, uh, which I did. It was a four-day course. I looked at the music, and I saw it had 5-8 uh, uh, and 10-8 time throughout it, and I shut it, and I thought, fine, okay, that's it. I'll never be able, I'll never be able to, to manage it unless the person running the course is good enough to make us able to play it. There are about 22 of us on the course. And sure enough, because of Pam Smith's immense professionalism and ability, I can not only sing you the, uh, the, the piece, but I can, I can play it as well, um, without fault, mostly. Uh, and uh, so it, it gave me some hope this morning that if uh, I've been listening to God properly and I can do my job well, this rather difficult passage that we've got uh, might become a bit clearer. Uh, that's my prayer. In fact, let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is not an easy passage, so please help me as I try to uncover the truths and pass them on. We want to live in peace and unity. We want to be non-judgmental. We also have views, sometimes very strong views about things, so I pray for clarity 
in what you want us to understand better, to know when to stand and when to back down in love. So may you speak through me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to do this in two parts. I'm going to um, present uh, the issues to you and then we're going to look um, at our response. So Christian liberty is the theme for today. <laughs> Great, I thought. Give Margaret uh, the, and Jonathan law and duty and dull things like that and give me liberty. Hooray! I was really excited. And then I discovered that it's a great deal easier keeping the law than, than working out what is the right thing to do. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know where you are with the law. You know, uh, don't murder, don't take sharp objects or liquids on airplanes, don't drive over 70 miles an hour uh, on the motorway, don't, don't drive your bicycle down the motorway, Will. Um, ask him about that afterwards. Uh, wear a mask indoors. We'll come back to that one. We may or may not keep the law. Uh, as we saw when Margaret raised the issue and, and she asked people how many people kept the speed limit and there were a number of my Christian brethren here who put their hands up uh, who said that they actually occasionally drove over 30 miles an hour when there was a speed limit. So, but the point is we clearly know with the law when we're doing wrong. People need rules. So let's listen to this passage and see what Paul has to tell us and then we'll carry on with it. So it's Sylvia, if you'd like to read it to us. So we're reading the whole of Romans 14 and verse 1 of 15. And its title is, Do Not Judge One Another. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their personal opinions. Some people's faith allows them to eat anything, but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. Those who will eat anything are not to despise those who don't, while those who eat only vegetables are not to pass judgment on those who will eat anything, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servants? It is their own master who will decide whether they succeed or fail. And they will succeed because the Lord is able to make them succeed. Some people think that a certain day is more important than other days, while others think that all days are the same. We should each firmly make up our own minds. Those who think highly of a certain day do so in honour of the Lord. Those who will eat anything do so in honour of the Lord, because they give thanks to God for the food. Those who refuse to eat certain things do so in honour of the Lord, and they give thanks to God. None of us lives for himself only. None of us dies for himself only. If we live, it is for the Lord that we live. And if we die, it is for the Lord that we die. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For Christ died and rose to life in order to be the Lord of the living and of the dead. You then, who only eat vegetables, why do you pass judgment on others? And you who eat anything, why do you despise other believers? All of us will stand before God to be judged by him. For the scripture says, as surely as I am the living God, says the Lord, everyone will kneel before me and everyone will confess that I am God. Every one of us then will have to give an account of ourselves to God. This next bit says, do not make one another fall. So then, let us stop judging one another. 
Instead, you should decide never to do anything that would make another stumble or fall into sin. My union with the Lord Jesus makes me certain that no food is of itself ritually unclean. But if a person believes that some food is unclean, then it becomes unclean for that person. If you hurt your brother or sister because of something you eat, then you are no longer acting from love. Do not let the food that you eat ruin the person for whom Christ died. Do not let what you regard as good get a bad name. For God's kingdom is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of the righteousness, peace and joy which the Holy Spirit gives. And when people serve Christ in this way, they please God and are approved by others. So then, we must always aim at those things that bring peace and that help strengthen one another. Do not, because of food, destroy what God has done. All foods may be eaten, but it is wrong to eat anything that will cause any that will cause someone else to fall into sin. The right thing to do is keep is to keep from eating meat, drinking wine, or doing anything else that will make your brother or sister fall. Keep what you believe about this matter, then, between yourself and God. Happy are those who do not feel guilty when they do something they judge is right. But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith, and anything that is not based on faith is sin. We who are strong in the faith ought to help the weak to carry their burdens. We should not please ourselves. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. And that, as Brucey used to say, is all there is to it. I should say that in a past life, I was uh, much more used to doing the talk at the children's service, as you may have already gathered from the way we opened the service. So I feel terribly grown up trying to unpack Romans here for you. But it is a masterpiece, the letter to the Romans. And he covers loads of subjects from lots and lots of different angles. And I saw that Bishop Tom Wright wrote He brings all the issues together into a fast-moving and compelling line of thought. Reading this letter sometimes feels like being swept along in a small boat on a swirling, bubbling river. We need to hold on tight if we're going to stay on board. But if we do, the energy and excitement of it is all unbeatable. So are you ready? The the thing is, when I... When I became a Christian... um, Uh, in my second year of doing my theology degree at Bristol. I became a Christian through a a conservative evangelical church, Anglican Church, Christ Church, uh, Clifton. And everything was given to us in very black and white terms. There was no grey. And that was really helpful when I first became a Christian. But as I, quite soon after I started my journey, I realised that actually... Things are not black and white. They are many, I don't know if it's 50, but many shades of grey. Do you find that? Yeah. Yeah? So as I was saying before we heard the reading, you know, when you have the law, it's actually a lot easier to be black and white than to try and work things out for yourselves. But that's what we're trying to do this morning. We need rules. There was a, a story of boys playing football and complaining about all the rules. So the the sports teacher said, well, okay, I'll tell you what, for the next quarter of an hour, just just play football how you like. You make up the rules, you decide. And they went, yay, yippee. But very soon, they they kind of thought, well, they didn't know who to pass the ball to, they didn't know where the goals were, the goalposts were literally moving, and and they were really fed up. It, It was no fun, because they didn't know where they stood. So we need rules. Liberty is a a two-edged sword. 
don't we see this with masks? You know, I mean, we were told we had to, and we did, unless we were exempt, obviously. And, and, and then we were told, well, we didn't need to. And now we're being told we have to again. Nobody's going, oh, no one do that. <laughs> yeah? So it's much easier if they just said, just do it. And then people can do it. People in a democracy don't do things, which is why the people in the West have been so hard hit by COVID. Because we kind of go, no, we've got liberty. We don't have to do this. is outrageous, the government are telling us what to do. However, moving on. So liberty is a kind of two-edged sword. And also, contrary to what some of us believe, we don't actually all see things in the same way, do we? We have committed Christians on both sides of, of the House of Commons, but they see things differently. Someone may think that a, a, an old picture of a naked woman is an absolute masterpiece. Someone else might think it's obscene and pornography. We might have... Um, we might have some deep theological discussions. I, I miss the discussions that, that Jonathan and the rest of us had on the Zoom coffee mornings. I thought they were brilliant, you know, but someone listening in might have thought we were all talking heresies. We don't see things in the same way. Matters of conscience. Should we all become vegan? I, you must have heard as I have, you know, we should all become vegan if we want to save the planet. And I was actually at a lunch, I was actually at a lunch the other day when this guy opposite me was complaining that his son was a vegan, and because my daughter Kate is vegan, my ears pricked up. And, uh, and he was saying um, that he felt that it was a really infuriating and selfish thing for him to be a vegan. And, and it, I said, well, why? Why do you feel that? Because this is a matter of conscience for him, surely. He said, yes, why can't our son, just for one day in the year, be sensible? and eat meat so that his mother doesn't have to cook two Christmas lunches. I can leave you to suggest the answers I might have given him. And I was, in a way, I was terribly excited when I came to this passage, this long passage, because I thought, oh my goodness, I've walked into the letter of Romans. We're talking about what we can eat and, and food offered to idols and whether we should eat this and whether we shouldn't. So that was quite, quite interesting. So the law is easy, but matters of conscience are much more difficult. There are three words, two words uh, and a phrase that Paul uses in that passage that Sylvia read for us. And I think we just need to understand those and unpack those before we think about um, what, uh, how we should carry this passage on in our lives. Those phrases are the weak in faith, the strong in faith, and the other phrase is about uh, on the good news uh, translation, personal opinions, or we may know it if we read the other versions as disputable matters. He uses two examples to illustrate his point, food and holy days. Let's, let's start with the weak. By weak, Paul doesn't mean a vulnerable Christian overcome very easily by temptation. He means someone who hasn't yet fully understood the liberty that Christ has won for them. Perhaps we could say that they were immature or untaught or, or maybe new to the faith. The strong, they rejoiced in their Christian freedom, perhaps riding a bit too roughshod over the weak. Uh, people with more scruples, if you like, with regard to conscience, who I think actually, I think the strong were probably going to feel a bit red-faced when this letter was read out, to be fair. But um, Paul allies himself with the strong, with those who understood that Christ had fulfilled the law. In Mark 7, it says, nothing you eat or drink can harm your relationship with God because it only goes into your mouth uh, in, into your stomach, um, through your mouth into your stomach, not into your heart. So all food, and that included meats that were previously seen as unclean, and we saw that with Peter and Cornelius too, didn't we, with the net of animals coming down. All that is okay to eat now. So picture the scene. On, on this side, we've got uh, a weak in faith Christian in the marketplace and he's surrounded by a, a weak, wicked, corrupt world. 
It's a pagan world. So he feels that it's best to just shun everything completely. And if that means not eating meat, which was unlawful, i.e. pork in those days, or meat that wasn't prepared in a kosher way, or that had been, if he was Jewish, or that had been offered to uh, idols, if he had a, a, a Gentile background, if it meant not eating that meat, then so be it. He would go without. That's his view. That's what his conscience tells him is right, not to eat it. And at the market, he sees a woman over there buying meat, which has obviously come from a pagan temple. How appalling. She's completely letting the side down. She's breaking the rules, so he believes. And she deserves condemnation. That's the weak person, weak in faith. The meat buyer, likewise called to a life of holiness, is described by Paul as strong in faith. She's been taught the deep and rich truth that the one true God is creator and redeemer. All things, including meat, belong to God. She knows that nothing you eat can make you unclean. We've seen that. So she's at liberty to eat meat, whether previously offered to idols, whether kosher or not. Christ has liberated her from such rules now. And those who refuse to accept their liberation are narrow-minded, timid, stupid people, and they should be looked down on. That's her view. Her conscience is clear. Paul says as long as they both act for God's glory, they can each follow their convictions of conscience. As my favorite verse from the Message Bibles puts it, this is verse five and six from Romans, if you eat meat, eat it to the glory of God and thank God for prime rib. <laughs> if you're a vegetarian, eat vegetables to the glory of God and thank God for broccoli. <laughs> Isn't that a great verse? Thank God for broccoli. There you have it. Two opposing views, two committed Christians both thanking God for their food and both having clear consciences. And all of that is fine as long as they live in peace and unity. But the problem is that they despise each other. They think they're letting the side down or they're too narrow-minded or they're too brash. Do you see? That's the clash. That's, that's the problem. If, if you keep to your own view and respect others, fine. But if you ridicule or judge or mock or fight with other people over such issues, that's not good. And it's not glorifying to God. Again, the Message Bible, don't let a piece of God-blessed food become an occasion of soul poisoning. Don't let a piece of God-blessed food become an occasion of soul poisoning. It's their reaction to each other which is the problem. Narrow-minded, stupid, rule-breaker. What's the bit they've forgotten, everybody? What have they forgotten? Thank you, Stephen. Love your neighbor. That's what Jesus said. To love and to accept each other, not to judge each other's consciences. That's God's prerogative alone. So, new and different issues crop up all the time, apart from food and holy days. Although, I mean, I was certainly part of the Keep Sunday Special campaign back in the day. Um, but we as church need to work out how we live together in unity and peace and learn from each other's points of views and other people's traditions and views and not look down on them. So I hope, that, I hope that clarifies what he means by the weak in faith and the strong. Give me a straw poll. Is it a bit clearer than it was after the reading? Good. Is it less good than it was? <laughs> no, no, don't, don't put your hands on that. The third thing I said I wanted to just unpack a bit is, is what he calls personal opinions or disputable matters. And I did have my thing here. So he says, welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their personal opinions. Doubtful points, 
disputable matters which are of secondary oh, sorry. drop something here which are of secondary importance and on which Christians don't need to agree it may be customs it may be ceremonies which are not part of the gospel or creed or matters we may believe to be cultural to biblical times only and so no longer important for us here we go here's something I picked this up yesterday from our dining room table. This is Lidl's cat catalogue for Christmas. Okay, big on. A Christmas you can always believe in. That's a disputable matter to me. My Christmas is not going to be found on the shelves of Lidl. Yeah? And, and I mean, it's obviously their slogan because a big on a Christmas you can always believe in. At Lidl, we're big on a Christmas you can always believe in. We're here for Christmas today, the next year, and the far, 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 far future. And at the end, because we're big on a Christmas you can always believe in. I mean, give, give me patience. Dear me. That's disputable. Who can tell me what the eighth commandment is? Well done. Well done, says the vicar. So... The Eighth Commandment is, you shall not steal. But in 1 Corinthians 3.21, Paul states, all things are yours. So it's okay for me to take anything I want, isn't it? Yep. I like your necklace, Susan, I'll have that. I like your scarf, Marion, I'll have that. That's okay, isn't it? That's my liberty in the gospel. Yeah, and I won't condemn you for your legality on telling me I can't if you don't get at me for my liberty on saying that's very nice, I'll have one of those, thank you. Disputable? No, it is forbidden. It's very clear in the Old Testament and it's backed up again in the New. How about this? I was reading Leviticus 19.19. Does anybody know what Leviticus 19.19 says? Really ought to read your Bibles more. <laughs> Sorry? It's about wearing mixed fibers. Give that man a prayer. Well. <laughs> well done, Stephen. So Stephen and I have been reading <laughs> Leviticus 19.19, which forbids wearing clothes of two different fabrics. Should I chuck out all my mixed fabric clothes and start picketing shops selling the wrong type of clothing? Disputable? Very, absolutely. Jesus didn't say anything about your polycotton sheets or your shirts. It's not, it's not, it's a matter of complete indifference to most people and definitely not worth us falling out over. Yeah? Paul was willing to fight to the death for the truth of the gospel. What's the truth of the gospel? Christ died. Let's do that again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Don't you love the feel of a family service? That's non-negotiable. Yeah, that's non-negotiable. But there are other things about which the Bible is unclear. I'm sorry, I know it's, you know, Timothy, you know, the word of God and all of that. But there are certain passages that are unclear. Silent. Right? There's nothing about not smoking in the Bible silent or open to opposing interpretations particularly in the light of Christ's life and ministry his examples that we heard were food and drink and holy days what examples can you think of turn, turn to the person next to you two minutes think about what modern examples can you think of of disputable or indisputable matters what is a, a, a personal opinion that is negotiable turn to the person next to you Okay, has anybody come up with anything? If I was a man, I'd stroke my beard. Right, have you come up with anything? Marion and Will, you were deep in... Well, did you, Marion? I said years ago, I had to put the telly on a Sunday. Don't put the telly on on a Sunday? Keep Sunday very, very, very special. Absolutely. No sport on Sundays. Absolutely. No dancing. No supermarkets. 
dancing. Anything else? Don't go shopping on a Sunday. The lottery, don't gamble. Anything else? Wearing masks or not wearing masks is not sitting on yeah it's very I won't go there because we'll be here forever but um, there is a very interesting um, point uh, made by Roger Forster and Paul Marston who are uh, friends of ours from um, Ixus Christian Fellowship and and they make the point that that Sunday is not Sabbath the Sabbath very 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 clearly um, was for the Jews only it was not for everybody else. And therefore, I mean, as I said earlier, I joined the Keep Sunday Special campaign, and I believe that, but, but it's, it, it's not a Sabbath. It, 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 anyway, interesting. But yeah, there were loads of things we couldn't do on, on Sundays. Women in church leadership. You know, women keep silent in church. Oh, where's my mask? You know, we, that's disputable. Head cut, well, I've got, some of us have got them, Stephen. <laughs> Um, the giving and receiving of a wedding ring was very hotly contested in the 17th century, you know. <laughs> Disputable. Um, lo loads of things. The use of cosmetics and jewellery. Um, I mean, you were talking about sport on Sunday. Think about Eric Liddell. You know, he would be a week in the faith Christian. But my goodness, what a, an astonishing um, example he was, yeah? Uh, uh, if you don't know about Eric Liddell, ask Will afterwards, <laughs> or ask me. Um, so th these are all sorts of matters that the Christian is, is not clear about. I mean, pacifism certainly comes to my mind as, as something that might be disputable. What we must never forget, I think, is that one person's understanding of ceremony or symbols, for example, may be very different from our own. There, were, there, there, there was a, an Anglican vicar who was quite low church, and he moved into a church that was high church. And uh, he decided after a while there that he was just going to bring all the ceremony down a, a notch. So he said to himself, you know, I'm not going to elevate the host. When it comes to communion, which the church called Eucharist, but he called communion, he, I'm not going to put it up here. I'm just going to do it lower key. And, and he thought about it and he prayed about it and he was ready. If anybody had any questions, he was ready to answer why he, he felt that this was important. So he went through the service, he did communion uh, and he was ready for any questions. No one came up to him uh, over coffee um, except one lady. And she said, I saw you didn't elevate the host vicar. And he said, no, no, I didn't. Because that's how vicars talk, don't they? He said, no, I didn't. Was it, was it a problem for you? And uh, she said, no, no, it wasn't a problem for me, vicar. But, but that's the cue for me to turn on the urn. And that's why the coffee was late this morning. <laughs> <laughs> we never know, do we, how our actions may affect other people. So we need to work out how we can handle our differences, both so that we don't disrupt our fellowship, but also because the world's watching and Christians fighting each other is the worst sort of witness that we can possibly show. We're going to sing a song now, and then I'm going to look much, much more briefly at our response. So stand and sing. These are the days of Elijah.
How should we respond to those who are weak or strong in the faith? Hmm, I wonder which one you think you are. Let me ask you, do you smoke? Do you drink a little? A bit more? Too much? Do you shop on Sundays? Do you wear mixed fabrics? <laughs> we can probably all supply justification for doing or not doing any of those activities. I want to hear a resounding yes or no here, okay? Are we sinners? Yes. yes. 
Do we all sin? Yes. Does God still love us? Yes. Do we still love and accept each other despite doing any of the above? Yes. <laughs> oh, let's have an amen. Um, and that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, we hope we do. We try to. We want to live in peace and unity. But sometimes something that you do may just affect me badly. On one hand, I look to my conscience to decide if I can or I can't do something. Meat offered to idols doesn't change its chemistry. But if the person eating it means that they're then worshipping the idol, then it is wrong to eat it. I ask myself, is it right? Can I account to God for my action? If so, yep, then I can indeed do it. On the other hand, on disputable matters, as in so many things, I must look to the law of love as the overriding factor. That's more important. It may be lawful for me to do something, but if by doing it I cause a brother or a sister to sin, then I sin. Love limits its own liberty out of respect for other people's consciences. Faith instructs our consciences. Love respects others' consciences. I'll say that again. Faith instructs our consciences. Love respects others' consciences. Yeah? So what does Paul tell us to do? One, welcome with open arms those with different views because God has already welcomed them. Two, don't be quick to judge as the message says, don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. It's very easy sometimes, isn't it, just to jump in and say, oh, you're wrong. Thirdly, allow people to have different views from our own without judging them. He talks about not judging four times in this passage, so it's obviously really important for us not to judge other people. I don't know about you, I used to, I used to play a uh, a, a game with a friend where we'd sit at a cafe and, and make up stories about other people. Did you ever do that? No, no. <laughs> well, I don't do that game anymore. <clears throat> we were young. Don't look down on others. That's <laughs> very difficult for me to do. But, um, um, what else? Do what you think is right. Listen to your conscience. Assume the best about other people's motives, that they want to honour God and give thanks to him, even if they're doing it differently to you. Be sensitive about others' consciences. Don't generally drink, for example, in front of someone who regards drinking alcohol as wrong. Do it in your own home, but don't do it in front. Don't put that in front of other people. Don't make others stumble. Help and encourage one another. And always act in love. And remember that Christian liberty is secondary to Christian love. It's not about our rights, but about our responsibilities to others. Ultimately, we all have to account to God for our actions. So, to summarise, as I think he means, if it's right for you and you can justify it before God, do it. If it's not right, don't do it. If it's okay for you, but may negatively affect someone else, act in love and don't do it. If it feels wrong for you, don't do it just to follow others. Does that make sense? There was a medieval writer, Rupertus Meldinius. You've probably never heard of him, but you may have heard what he said, which was, on the essentials, unity on the non-essentials freedom in everything love Lord I pray for a new unity in the church help us to focus today and each day on what the kingdom of God is really about 
and what we're about to sing, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You may not know this. Stand up, sway. It's a calypso. We have miracle things that Will's going to bring round. Be children, enjoy. Pamela has rewritten this specially so that it's much easier to sing for us, so we can join in. But if you don't know it, just swing and enjoy. And remember, righteousness, peace and joy is what the kingdom of God is all about. Thank you. Righteousness, peace and joy. Roz asked me to lead the prayers and intercessions after all that. Thank you. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, after all of that noise and excitement and joy, let's just uh, calm our thoughts for a moment or two. It's lovely to praise God and lovely to uh, be responsive in that way. And uh, we want to take those responses into our, our week, into the encounters that we will have, the situations we'll be in. And we want to go into those places with joy, with peace. But we also want to go in with sensitivity and care about how we use the liberty and freedom that we have. 
So maybe just for a moment, look ahead into your week. Think about a, a, a situation you might be in or an encounter you might have or a relationship with someone at work or in your family or maybe even here within the church family where there might be a difference, where there might be uh, a strong or weakness. And we give thanks for that liberty we have in Christ. But may we always be sensitive and careful about how we use that. May we always assume the best of motives to others. May we always be subject to the law of love. Amen. We lit our second Advent candle at the beginning of the service, reminding us of the peace that God comes to bring that we look forward to in Advent but we know there is much in the world that is not at peace much in our own local community that is not at peace so we pray that we may be agents of peace to those around us God our Father, you spoke to the prophets of old of a saviour who would bring peace. You helped them to spread the joyful message of his coming kingdom. Help us as we prepare to celebrate his birth, to share with those around us the good news of your power, of your love and of your peace. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the light who is coming into the world. Amen. And amidst our concerns for the world, there is so much where we would want to give our prayers and our thinking. Obviously, issues around the COVID pandemic, this latest variant and all the unknowns surrounding that. The way in which inclement weather has affected so many people and may yet continue to do so. A tragic case of Arthur in Coventry make us think of children and families who are uh, in much need of support and care. And we pray for those of our own church family, especially remembering Chris G this morning after the sudden death of her son Pete and his family just in the quietness let's hold all those people and those places and things before God and ask his blessing upon them Lord in your mercy Hear our prayer. A prayer meditation for Advent. Christ of the cosmos, living word, come to heal and save. Come from the depths of eternity, unfolding the purposes of God. Come from the dawn of time, shaping the universe, divine expression mystery made known in your quiet hidden way come to heal and save incognito in our streets beneath the concrete between the cracks behind the curtains within the dreams in aging memories in childhood wonder in secret ponds in broken hearts in Bethlehem stable still small voice word of God among us come to our divided world come to our fragmented lives come to heal and save in you our life is one again 
and all things come together, each connected to the other, each reflected in the other, ourselves and all things living. Heaven and earth, time and space, the whole created universe in you. Christ of the cosmos, living word, come to heal and save. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light now in the time of this mortal life in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that on the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. <coughs> Awaiting his coming in glory, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May the Lord, when he comes, find us watching and waiting. Our next hymn, please stand if you can, at the name of Jesus. Thank you, Will, for praying for Chris. Not everybody is aware, but this morning, Chris G's son died of a massive heart attack. So um, I have seen her this morning, and on the WhatsApp group, some of you had already responded, and I was able to read those messages out to her. And she was just so thrilled to realize how loved she is. So do hold her in your prayers. Um, the notices, there, Paul and Sarah Tester, their, their prayer letter, if you would like a copy, there are some copies at the back. And there are missionaries in Lima, Peru, with their three lovely girls. Okay, and thank you to Sylvia. Have you noticed our new notice board? Isn't it looking good? 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Sylvia. Okay. I mean, not only has she, she's changed the whole thing, she's put a new, new piece into it. So say thank you to your husband as well. Okay. Right, you've all received your notice of the Christmas events that are on. But can I say there's one event not here that's the first event, which is this Wednesday at 2 p.m. We're decorating the church and putting some decorations in the hall as well, <laughs> what we can reasonably do in the hall. So if you would like to come on Tuesday, or Wednesday rather, at 8 o'clock, 2 o'clock. <laughs> Shall I put my teeth back in and reconnect my brain? <laughs> okay. Wednesday the 8th of December at 2 o'clock. We're decorating the church and you're all invited to help. Drinks will be provided and a little bit of sustenance. You'll bring some tinsel, right? <laughs> Lovely, thank you. All right. Friday the 10th at 4 o'clock, leaving from, leaving from where the doctor's surgery is, the Phoenix opposite, is the lantern parade and our sheep made by the renew one group will be paraded along with all the lanterns that the children have made from the schools and from other organizations all right and that will light up it's going to look amazingly spectacular the face it now has a face on it you can't see he's looking away as a shy sheep <laughs> Okay, it's not Sean Sheep, it's a shy sheep. <laughs> okay, but he's got a lovely smile on him. All right, but we would... <laughs> no, the hole is there to switch the lights on inside. <laughs> it's a holy sheep. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I haven't had any offers yet to be Mary and Joseph. If you would like to be Mary and Joseph for me, I will put you down to be Mary and Joseph in our little nativity the stable that we have. Those pieces of wood behind the, the piano in the church hall become the stable and with our manger there. And so people can have their photographs taken there. But also at five o'clock on the green, that's where the shops are, the choristers will be singing from Gloucester Cathedral till half past five. Then the churches have been invited to sing carols. So we would love you to come along to add voice to the carol singing, to help the community to sing carols, all right? It's an amazing uh, uh, invitation. So at 5.30, we will be singing carols, all right? So if you can come along and join and look around the stalls that will be also on the roundabout. So that's this coming Friday. Sunday is promise fulfilled, the service on Sunday. And this is what do we have to bring that Sunday? Bring your lunch, yes, bring your lunch. We're staying on afterwards, so we will eat our lunch here, and we will have a carol sing-along, or carol-along, as I've called it where we'll be singing Christmas carols together and just celebrating together because we're so limited in what we can do now because of COVID, all right? So do come along, bring your sandwiches. If you forget, there's always Tesco Express. Sorry, Ros, are we, are we permissible? <laughs> it's up to your conscience, okay? But there's always Tesco Express for a meal deal, okay? <laughs> And we will sing. Mike and Mandy are with us next week singing. So we will, and they will be staying along with Monica and we will be, have live music as well for our carols. Okay. But I have missed one out. Saturday the 11th of December, we're making up the Christmas bags here at 9.30 in the morning. All right, after the food drop. And please, can you let me know if you're planning on coming along to help make up the Christmas bags? And any last gifts to come by the 11th, if you haven't brought them today, for, for going in the bags. And also, if you're, doing, if you're going to bake something to go in, can you have a word with me? 
because we will put things in the toddler mum's bags ready to go out on Tuesday. That's a week of Tuesday, which is when they have their party and it's their last meeting. But the ones going to the people in the food drop will not go out until the following Saturday. So it may be a case of delayed bakes, or you may want to bake twice. But if you can just let me know so we can try and coordinate that. It's because of Christmas being on a Saturday. I keep saying that, don't I? <laughs> it's at the end of the week, it makes, makes timings very different. OK, so the toddler party is on Tuesday, the 14th. And then we, please note, 19th of December, if you want to take any of these to give to somebody to specially invite them, but we have our family carols by candlelight at 4 p.m. And we will light candles around the church as we did two years ago. Can you believe it was two years ago we did it? <laughs> and it was followed by drinks and warm mince pies. So please do come along to that as well. All right, and Alan, you wanted to say something as well? Thank you, so much going on, but there is one thing I would like to, some, some people already know, um, the Redwell Center, uh, the major users are Grow Active, we're, we're, the, we're a charity which support vulnerable adults and uh, people with with severe disabilities, and they're 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 lovely, and and half of them, at least, won't be able to sing, won't be able to speak or read, but they they we're they're, they're enacting this Christmas story, which I've I've written with inter, inter, interspersed carols, and they'd love you to go along. On, on it's the one day they haven't got anything on the fifteenth of December, Wednesday at two o'clock in the Redwell Centre. If you can be there. A lot of them, they, they, they don't know the, the detail of Christmas, but I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased that God has given us this opportunity, and they're enthusiastic about telling you it. So please, if you want to, Wednesday the 15th, 2 o'clock in the Redwall Centre in Redwall Road, be there if you can. Thank you. It's a beautiful script. Yes? So much going on. Here's a blessing from Romans 15, verses 5 and 6. And now may God, the source of patience and encouragement, enable you to have the same point of view among yourselves by following the example of Christ Jesus, so that all of you together may praise with one voice the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I know it's late. I have one final thought, which I just think is important to, to share with you. I've got a guitar string here. It's come, it's due to go on my guitar. And it's free to move in any direction it likes. Just, yeah, it can hit the microphone, it can twirl and twine. If I twist one end, it responds. It's completely free. But what isn't it free to do? To sing. So I take it and I fix it onto my guitar. I bind it. And when it's bound, it's free for the first time to sing. Thank you, Diana. True freedom comes when we bind ourselves to Jesus and fix our eyes on him. So just as the guitar string comes alive when it's bound into the guitar, so we come alive in Christ. Jesus is the great liberator. Amongst all the business, he sets us free. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pamela. Praise him on the trumpet, the psaltery and harp. Praise him on the timbrel and the dance. Praise him. The stringed instruments too Praise them on the loud cymbals Praise them on the loud cymbals Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord Hallelujah 
praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. 